long before it was destroyed, this mosque in the northern Indian city of Ayodhya was a focus of dissent. Tensions had reached a high point around Babri Mashid, the mosque of Babar, in July, months ahead of events that would spark off modern India's worst outbreak of violence. The grounds were swamped by worshippers, not Muslims, but Hindus, convinced the 16th century building stood at the very birthplace of their warrior god, Ram. Spurred on by powerful Hindu politicians, they'd come forward as volunteers to start work on a temple at the disputed spot. This wasn't the first time there had been attempts to take over the mosque built by the first Mughal emperor. But Muslims had consistently refused to give up their claim to the building, which they no longer used. Unnerved by developments, their leaders called a national meeting. And in the spirit of India's founding father, Mahatma Gandhi, some Hindus attended to denounce their brethren's show of intolerance. Ayodhya, the place of no wars, five months later. Once again, Hindus were answering a call for a temple construction meeting by right-wing politicians. The leader of the fast-growing Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, and his Hindu fundamentalist partners had to pledge the gathering would be just a symbolic gesture under strict orders from the Supreme Court. But the crowds got out of hand. Faced with such vast numbers, the police could do little. Just before the start of the official prayer ceremony, it all went critical. At first, it was only a few. But before long, the mob mentality would take over. A few would become scores, then hundreds and thousands. Tired of their leaders temporizing, fired by religious zeal, they attacked. At the end of the assault, only rubble would be left of the Babri Mosque. The violence had just begun. Ayodhya had been an explosion waiting to happen. In 1990, the minority government of Prime Minister V.P. Singh was brought down over issues of caste and religion. Scenes that shocked the world, of Hindu students making the ultimate protest against plans to reserve more administration jobs for the lower castes. A believer in secular democracy, Singh was undermined by Lal Krishna Advani's BJP, which had put Ayodhya on its list of nationalist causes. Chandra Shekhar, a socialist, was the next prime minister until the 1991 elections. Elections which Advani might have won if Rajiv Gandhi had lived. As prime minister, he'd allowed Hindus to worship at Ayodhya five years earlier in return for special legislation for Muslims. His assassination brought a massive sympathy vote for his Congress party. Dominated by the Gandhi dynasty for so long, Congress turned to Narasimha Rao, known for his ability to outwit his rivals. The main one was the BJP, which had a huge majority in Uttar Pradesh, the state where Ayodhya is situated. The troubles could set India back for years to come. Even in the city slums, where ironically poverty is a major leveler. In this huge country of 900 million people, more than 80% are Hindus. Many of those from the lower castes live side by side with poor Muslims, united by want. Back in charge after its destruction, the paramilitary police at Ayodhya praying as rumors spread that they'd remained on the sidelines in sympathy with the attackers of the mosque. Inside a tent at the site, Hindu idols now under wraps, of the mosque itself, nothing was left but piles of loose stones. A testimony to the sentiments that had inspired the attack. By the next day, those too badly injured to leave were the only extremists still at Ayodhya. Rapid action forces were now imposing Delhi's direct rule over the state of Uttar Pradesh. Close to Ayodhya, Faizabad also bore the marks of the Hindu frenzy, evidence that the very essence of India's strictly secular constitution was under threat. 
As the last temple volunteers were moved out, troops secured the disputed site. Too late. Within a week, hundreds would die in riots throughout India and beyond. With right-wing Hindu leaders under arrest for inciting ethnic hatred, security forces were put on general alert in major cities, including the capital, New Delhi. Muslims, vastly outnumbered, feared for both their faith and their lives. They were not without support, however. Most Hindus believe in tolerance, and some of their leaders were putting the blame on the government. It is the responsibility of the government of India, and especially of the Prime Minister, that as he has lost all credibility to manage a critical situation in the country, he should go. There is no other option. When our constitution can also take care Sentiments of echoed by veteran Muslim of, parliamentarians who remember the bloodshed that preceded partition with Pakistan. Right now. The first thing is they believe the Prime Minister must pay the price of failing to stem the tide of intolerance. But Rao stayed put. Instead, he banned five radical religious groups, two Muslims, and the three Hindu directly linked with the attack on Ayodhya. But this did not stop the violence. In Bombay, a new pattern emerged. In the ruins of their former homes, residents claimed police were responsible for the deaths of almost all the 140 people killed in the first hours of rioting there. In retaliation, Muslims were venting their anger on Hindu temples and their contents. Just two days after the destruction of the Babri Mosque, rioting had spread to neighboring Pakistan. Scores died as large numbers of Muslims went on the rampage, attacking Hindu properties in places of worship. Government calls for calm went unheeded. In Rawalpindi alone, six temples were destroyed. Thousands of demonstrators took to the streets. They demanded the Indian Prime Minister order the Ayodhya Mosque to be rebuilt. Bangladesh also erupted in violence. It was almost inevitable in the Muslim country, which was once East Pakistan. Scores of protesters were injured as police fired rubber bullets into the crowds. In India, even nationalist Hindu leaders seemed overwhelmed by the situation. But when the court sentenced them to jail, there were cheers for those who for years had stoked the fires of religious intolerance and preached nationalism as the recipe to heal the country's ills. Advani himself was humbled at first, but not for long. Apparent calm at Parliament House betrayed the general disquiet. Many doubted that India's constitution would survive. However, Rao refused to believe the debacle was a sudden manifestation of widespread intolerance. It could not be spontaneous, it could not be uh, just on the spur of the moment and uh, knowing the way mm, they, they articulated it this time, mm, I am quite uh, sure that uh, it was pre-planned. Almost a week after the crisis, curfews were slowly lifting around Indian cities. But in New Delhi, new fires were ignited Angered by the arrests of their leaders, Hindu fundamentalists were seeking revenge on Muslims who retaliated with equal ferocity. More than a thousand deaths later, it looked increasingly as if the days of secular India were numbered, as if the dream of Mahatma Gandhi had founded. 